Yeah, and so this was one of the biggest game changer for me, being with Dean for a couple of weeks, observing him, how dedicated he is, and yeah, yeah this really kicked me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. We're in season four, where we are going for gold. And today I have the president-elect of the European Association of Facial Plastic Surgery, Frank Riedel. It's great to finally have you on this podcast, Frank. Thank oh, you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, so Frank, you, you're one of the most undercover guys on the international scene. So... <laughs> Tell the listeners where, just give them a little bit of a background. Where do you practice? How did you end up practicing? I want to hear your story. Well, my, my story started, I would say, in 1998. This was the year where I performed my first rhinoplasty. I was a first-year resident, so I started very early to perform rhinoplasties. I did, no, actually, I did my, my first internship many years, or some years before, yeah, yeah in London with Tony Bull, wow. and so I was really, really um, uh, kicked by performing rhinoplasties. Yeah, yeah. And so when I started my residency in 1997, yeah. after one year I performed my first rhinoplasty. So that's, it, that's it was, like 60 it was purely years ago, hang eh? Yeah, oh my God. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was, I mean, uh, really um, functional, but it started my training, and so everybody in the in my hospital, in the university hospital in Mannheim, uh, understood that I'm <laughs> a nose guy or You're a nose, nose nerd guy. or whatever. So I was really, <laughs> really interested and focused on this. Yeah. yeah, and then I so during my whole residency, I was the guy who performed all the rhinoplasties in this clinic, and um, so I really enjoyed it. But I did not really have a mentor, so I had to yeah. learn it on my own. Yeah. I had to go on, on, on conferences or observerships and observe and then come back in the OR and train. <laughs> so that's interesting because it's a similar path that I had. It's, was it perhaps because you were within the ENT department and the consultants weren't teaching you that, whereas it was kind of seen as a plastic surgery um, speciality to be a rhinoplasty surgeon or not? Yeah, I, I would say in Germany to, to make a kind of career to become a good position you have to be a good ear surgeon and mainly a tumor surgeon a head and neck yes. surgeon yes. and so they the the consultant they all focused on head and neck surgery on big cases yeah. and so there was not much room um yeah to train me and even i think they wouldn't would not have the expertise to really train yes. on me yes. Yes. so it, i was a little on my own okay but it was okay. I, I tried my very best to observe, to go on meetings, on courses, and whatever. And then in 2006, this was a game changer for me. Yeah. I had uh, I received a fellowship or yeah a fellowship uh, program of the German ENT Society, and they sent me to Dean Churyomi to Chicago. Wow. For uh, I think it was six weeks. Yes. And learning. It, it was in 2006 when he published all his famous papers on tip reshaping, yeah, structuring yeah, yeah. the tip with grafting and all this stuff. And so uh, from that day on, when I was in Chicago, I started to do open rhinoplasty. Yeah. Before that time, I did it closed because yeah. my boss wanted me to do only closed rhinoplasty. Mm -hmm. But from that day on, I because part of the fellowship program was to teach in Germany what I learned in Chicago. Okay, okay. And so I, obviously I only saw open rhinoplasties. And so, yeah, it was my job to teach what I s learned from Dean. And uh, then I had to tell my, my <laughs> head of the department, I, I have to do open rhinoplasties because I have to teach it. I have yes, to yes. take videos, photos, and I have to tra train yeah, myself yeah, yeah. in doing that. And then I started to give courses uh, of in, um, as part of the German ENT meetings, yeah. annual meetings. Yeah, and so this was one of the biggest game changer for me, being with Dean for a couple of weeks, observing him, how dedicated he is, and yeah, yeah this really kicked me. <laughs> wow, eh? and, and it's quite amazing to think that now, so you, you, at the university in Mannheim, uh -huh. 
there's this whole new academic resurgence from, but also on the, like on a political side, they've also poured, you know, I mean, you, you, in, in what, in three years' time, you're going to be the president of the European Association. I mean, think back to the mid-90s to think that's, that's where you're going to be. So let's just chat a little bit more, maybe first about the, the, what do you, your workplace, do you have fellows there, what, what happens? Well, in, in 2008, yeah. I decided to go into my own private practice or private clinic, um, and I decided against an academic career. Yeah. Uh, looking for a position as head of the department, so I decided to be on my own, yeah. together with one of my partners who does completely ENT, okay. so he's not a facial plastic surgeon, and yeah, so we founded our office. We are now 12 doctors uh, working there. Um, we have our own um, um, operating room. Yeah. We are just building the second one, yeah. and um, we're doing all our... Um, most of the cases there on an outpatient basis. Yes. And now we, I have two colleagues working with me. You met Cem already. Yeah, yeah. And Matthias is the other guy. They are, he's a general plastic surgeon, but, but he only focuses on rhinoplasties yeah. as well as Cem, who does a lot of research and yeah. a lot of clinic uh, stuff yeah. just based on rhinoplasty. Um, so we are 12 doctors, three of them Nose nerds, <laughs> really. Yeah. That's amazing. And and um, in terms of your association and involvement with the the European Association of Facial Plastic Surgery, tell us a little bit about that journey. Um, oh, it's difficult to remember, but I, I went to the annual meetings and I met Fazil. And oh, Fazil, if you meet Fazil, then you, he's going to change things. Eh? Definitely. <laughs> and I think at this time, Fazil spent also some time for a fellowship in Germany. Yeah. And he speaks very good German and he's a very kind guy. And yeah, and so uh, he introduced me to, to um, the board and to all the other guys. And um, yeah, and from this day on, I, I helped them with some media stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, and so I became connected and a couple of years ago, they voted me to the to the board, yeah, and I, I really enjoy yeah. uh, working for the academy. It's a great honor on one side, but I really like to teach and I like to, uh, yeah, bring people together and yeah. So the academy is the best platform for this. But now picking up on that media that you were mentioning, I love looking at your uh, what, your Instagram profile and seeing how dedicated you are on that to teaching. Yeah, but. When I started, there was no Instagram or Facebook or something like this. Yeah. So when I started to work for the academy, but we, but at this time there was big struggle with the general plastic surgeons because yeah. they started to state that only general plastic surgeons are allowed um, to perform like rhinoplasties of facial surgery, so, surgical so just procedures. To wrap there for a second, mm -hmm. I love my plastic surgery friends, and they all we we see each other as colleagues, and it's great, but. What I find it really interesting that you're going to spend five years specializing as an ENT head and neck surgeon. So you, your world literally revolves around here. Mm -hmm. And the plastic surgeon is going to spend five years on the whole body. But now when you graduate, suddenly the specialist on the nose is not the guy who's been on the nose for five years. I, I think this was a time where they were kind of misled. I yes. don't know why. Uh, and I have... My wife is a general plastic surgeon. I have so many friends yeah. among the general plastic surgeons. And I think it's always better to create partnerships Absolutely. and friendships. Absolutely. Uh, but at this time, it was kind of fight. Yes. And we were thinking of how can we defend our uh, EMT Absolutely. facial plastic yeah. surgery thing. And because like the fellow who's with me at the moment is a plastic mm -hmm. surgeon. And it's just wonderful. I think it's possibly an older generation thing where people don't want to share the knowledge and they were like, oh, I'll keep it to myself. Yeah. So I think the newer generation realizes that by collaborating, Definitely. at the end of the day, we can yeah. have better results for our patients. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yes. Um, Frank, I'm glad to see that you're healthy again. Last year, you had a bit of a health scare. Oh, well, I... I operation I, or something. Yeah, exactly. I crushed, yeah. I crushed my shoulder. <laughs> Actually, I think five or six years ago, I crashed during a ski ex skiing accident yeah. and I had a broken shoulder which was not operated at that time but probably the damage was there and now I, 
actually during a meeting I fall from the podium it was kind of annoying and yeah and then my my uh, ligaments yeah. had a ligament rupture and so this had to be fixed yeah but it I was just three weeks without surgery yeah so that was okay I, I mean I, I couldn't operate for, for three weeks. some social media and do some Instagram. Oh, videos. definitely. And I was on a, on a meeting in Thessaloniki with yeah. Yannis. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, and I enjoyed my time even when I could not operate. <laughs> so Frank, last uh, kind of area I want to chat to you about is your non-work life. Family, what do you do to relax? How do you manage the stresses? Tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, as I mentioned, I, I have my wonderful wife and I have two wonderful kids, two daughters who are 13 and 15 years old now. That's the perfect age to come for a safari in South Africa. Oh yeah, we will. <laughs> <laughs> we are waiting for invitation. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I, I would say most of the time when I'm not in the clinic and not in the OR, I try to spend with my family. That's the most important thing. And and then I do some exercises just to beware my neck from any other yeah, yeah. problems in the future because doing noses is really bad for the neck. Uh, as a, mainly if you are as tall as I am, so it's really kind of difficult. So I have always some pain in the neck. And do you operate with loops? Mm, I just ordered. <laughs> I and, just ordered and, some. And were you, do you using the through the lens loops or prism loops, which are at the angle? I just ordered prism yeah. angled loops. So I, I've always used loops when I operate. And I must say, since I've changed over about two years ago to the prism, it makes completely the world a difference for your neck. Yeah, I'm, I'm really and I'm looking forward to you. But yeah. I think that that's, that's cool. You think it'll, it'll work for you. Yeah. Hey, Frank, it's so nice to chat to you. I, I'm, <laughs> uh, there's like a, I'm quite excited for, I think, the future of the academy just because of like... Your, what you're bringing and what you're going to bring to us. It's, it's great. And it's a, it's a privilege to be able to chat to you. And, oh, come on. <laughs> and thank you for what you're doing for rhinoplasty around the world, Matt, and in Germany. I, I, I try my very best. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. Listen, I hope you have a great 2024. And guys, thank you for listening to another episode. Make sure you come back next week for another scintillating, interesting episode with one of these dynamic speakers that we managed to get hold of. Great. Thanks. So thank much, you very much. Cool. <laughs> For those of you who are only listening to this on a podcast platform, please try and reach out and get onto YouTube because on our YouTube channel, we've got some really cool clips where I interview the guests.